Hi, folks. You know, now that I've explained my solve, I'm going to probably do a couple more videos to show you the hints. I wanted to focus only on the poem because that's all you need to solve the treasure. So that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to mention the hints up front. I'm probably going to do like one more video, and it's probably going to be a long one because there are a ton of hints. And I want to put them all in one video. This is like kind of fun that you have after the fact. You know, like a lot of people have indicated, you know, the chase is over. And I've, I've said that too. Eric, uh, it is what it is, said it. You know, so there's really no point in discussing Forrest Fenn so much. So I've been like running through my head. What, what am I going to talk about? So I, I, I'm not really that interested in D.B. Cooper. Um, and I'm certainly uh, don't believe that D.B. Cooper was Forrest Fenn. So the only thing I helped out with is I tried to uh, help Jason to show him the ending of the flight path based on the air traffic control readout and the experience that I have with uh, navigation. So while I was doing that, of course, uh, Rick Nowak suggested maybe Amelia Earhart. And it's funny when you talk about the communities, because like I said, there's so many controversies in these communities. Um, I am interested in Amelia Earhart, and I did find some connections. Um, and I also showed where I believe it was, and I believe that it was southeast, southeast of Baker Island, and it was on basically a bunch of coral reefs. I believe they crashed somewhere around there. Um, I did some research in Stellarium, and I found out that on the day that she was lost, if they would have been over the island of Howland, which was their destination, when the sun rose that morning at 5.45 in the morning, I looked at the sky to see what the sky looked like on July 2nd, 1937, the day it happened. I noted that the, uh, noticed, of course, the sun brought rose exactly as expected, and it was at the same um, azimuth as expected. Um, of course, I wasn't accounting for the clouds and stuff like that in the sky, but I'm just getting a general overview. And um, one of the things I noticed in there is that the moon was visible and it was high in the sky, not quite 90 degrees, probably, probably less than that, but it would have been high in the sky and it would have been visible at sunrise. What that means is that um, low tide would have been at Howland because whenever the sun is directly over a position, it pushes the water in the ocean down and on the opposite side of the earth, it bulges out. In other words, it causes low tide directly below the moon and 180 degrees on the upside of the earth, it would be high tide. Now, those reefs that are there they're usually like right at sea level or maybe one foot below sea level, let's say. Well, at low tide, the, the tide, the water height can change the horizon by, let's say, three feet. Those reefs from a distance could have appeared to be islands, okay, but they, they're not. In, in, the, in the worst case, it would have been shallow water. So anyway, I believe that's where they went down. I don't think they went all the way down to where people think they meant. I don't think they crossed the equator. I think that they were about roughly 150 miles south of where they thought they were. And it was just due to some navigational mistakes combined with the weather and combined with inaccurate fixed positions so that they can validate their dead reckoning. And that along with winds that were blowing from the north and headwinds that would slow them down and various other things, it would cause his dead reckoning to be inaccurate because there is no nothing other than the stars to navigate at night. And I believe that puts them south. So that left out Amelia Earhart. So then I looked at something else regarding Boston Heist, where a bunch of uh, very valuable paintings, I think five or six of them, were stolen. And I believe it happened in the 90s. That's an unsolved crime. That's pretty interesting. Of course, it's very difficult to solve, but I'm looking at that. And then the other thing that kind of caught my interest is the Dutch. Dutch Schultz, the Dutchman, you know, basically a mobster from the 20s who um, reportedly hid money and jewelry in the Catskill Mountains of New York that would be worth today's money anywhere between 50 and $100 million. That's going to be a lot difficult to figure that one out because, honestly, we don't know that he actually hid it. Um, and a lot of the locations that people speculate 
is based on things that he said while he was dying, like the last hour of his life. Um, they recorded exactly what he said to the police chief. And that information is easy to obtain. And that pretty much led a lot of people to the same location. And there's been books written on it. One of the books, uh, people generally think that it was hidden somewhere near the uh, Devil's Face, it's called, which is somewhere near Devil's Rock. And they believe that he buried it somewhere around there. But a lot of other people indicate that those guys, uh, mobsters, were not mountain men. Uh, so they were not likely to go too far into the woods. Um, so they probably, you know, dug a hole pretty close to a road. They're not the kind of people you're going to find out backpacking in, you know, in the middle of nowhere. But again, you know, it, it was all based on somebody that was delusional and they're on their deathbed and they're just saying those things. And, you know, so nobody really knows. They do know, obviously, the guy had a lot of money and a lot of gangsters did not like putting money in banks, especially in the 20s and 30s. So there's, you know, there's a lot of reasons to speculate that maybe he did. So I thought about looking into that. Um, so I don't know. I think I'm going to pick something and I'm going to try to go with that for future videos. But I also want to make another comment. I was listening to uh, Candy, you know, Chasing Indy. Um, and I was listening to her in Street Talk. And that's interesting stuff that they were talking about. I, I'm into the same kind of things, you know outer space and black holes and and um space travel and it's just doing stuff outside again this has nothing to do with forest man but um you know it, it's really cool to listen to that especially you know i i don't smoke pot my doctor actually told me i should get medical marijuana but i haven't uh pursued it yet but i probably should because some of the things they, that those guys talk about you know it's really funny it's really cool and it's kind of deep thought. And, you know, I especially like what uh, Street says, you know, about the black holes and stuff like that. And they were, him and Candy were discussing things, you know, stars like Beetlejuice, Sirius, Rigel, um, and so on. The, the, the well known stars, Polaris, you know, because those are used for navigation. And I brought that up with Amelia Hart and D.B. Cooper. And of course, my solution itself is based around a place that observed, was made to observe stars, which would be the medicine wheel. So one of the things, you know, I wasn't there uh, last night. I was trying to get some sleep for a change. But one of the things I want to mention here, and I'm curious if uh, what Street thinks about this and what uh, Candy thinks about this. I believe in aliens. There's no way that somebody is going to convince me that in the entire universe, we happen to be the only planet you know, in the in in one of the millions of galaxies and solar systems, and we're the only ones that has life. I I just don't believe that. The fact is, other life has to exist somewhere, and there's a lot of theories and a lot of mysteries about this, and that's why I enjoyed listening to what Candy and the uh, Street were talking about. There's a lot of theories that the aliens are living even here with us, among us. And they're living like in a parallel universe. And it's a really interesting thought. They would be like in another dimension. Okay. So that's why you can't see them. And and the way I like to explain that is let's say we had a mountain over a mountain over here. Okay. And then we had another mountain over here. And then we had this little little ant. Okay. And let's imagine for the moment that the ant was 2D. And in other words, all he could see is within his plane. He can only see this way and this way, you know, all around him, but only in one plane. He can't see anything below him. He can't see anything above him. Okay. He won't even see this mountain. He'll run into it. It'll look like a wall and he'll start moving up, but he only sees 2D. So now his plane would be like this, right? When he's walking, he can only see in front and back to his left and to his right, not up or down. So the way to explain this is, so we have that ant. Let's say there's another ant up here. And let's say that these ants, although they're in 2D, they're high tech, man. These are smart little buggers, right? So they got radio communication. This ant is talking to this ant. A UFO, an alien, whatever you want to call it. He was up on the mountain. So let's say that that ant was over here. 
And directly in front of him in this 2D plane of view, there was an alien in an airplane landed. Now, remember, he can only see in 2D. And let's say that he's telling his buddy, wow, there's an alien right here in front of me. And they're on that radio. Like I said, they're high tech. This guy takes off. He'll no longer see it. It disappeared instantly. According to him, the thing just vanished in thin air. It's gone. He's going to tell his buddy up here, you know, hey, Joe, man, you know, that thing that I just seen, it's just gone. It just disappeared. Well, he doesn't see it because he doesn't see it flying up here. So it comes over here. And by the way, I don't know if you can hear somebody talking in the background. That's actually Stewie. Uh, she's saying, what's your name, bro? We do that. We're trying to teach her her name. She knows her name. So go, you know, my name is Stewie. Anyway, so the ants up there, this guy leaves and he says, wow, it vanished. And it lands over here. Now, obviously, a person that can see 3D would see that that flew from here to here. But to this ant, it would appear out of nowhere, it just appeared right in front of him. And he's like, whoa, whoa, that thing you were just talking about, it's right in front of me. It just appeared. <laughs> now, let's say that, you know, this was a, a very far distance to the ants. Because remember, for an ant to walk from here down and all the way up here is going to take a long time. But to somebody that's in 3D, they would just fly directly to the other peak. But these ants don't see that. Just like we wouldn't see in the fifth or sixth or seventh or tenth, whatever dimension. We just can't, we can't see it. Our, our, we're not, our minds are not made to, to even understand that, how something like that can exist. So what, this distance traveled in that other dimension would be space travel, would be like through a black hole or the universe is folded in on itself. So instead of this mountain being here and this mountain being here, they would be like this. And this guy only had to travel from here, where he is, up to here. So he only had to fly up to here. And this ant is not really over here. He's up here. But you just can't think like that, right? So he traveled through a rip of time to get from one place to another. That could be kind of how space travel works. And uh, Street mentioned something interesting that we've seen like UFOs that'll go shoot across the, the uh, air faster than anything we've ever seen and then automatically make a 90 degree turn, which is impossible with what we know. I just showed you a case where it wouldn't be possible if you traveled without being able to see the other dimension. It would look like this yellow dot went from here to here instantaneously. So it could be that when we see UFOs, right, if they're real, they're traveling in another dimension and we're catching a glimpse of them as they pass through our plane of view. In other words, like the, this, this um, ant can only see in front and, be at, and back and to either side of himself. So he would see this is his plane of view, right? Same thing with this ant. When it went and came down here, okay, let's say instead of coming down over there, out of the middle of nowhere, an object appeared in the sky and just have, appeared to hover. Well, it crossed through his plane when it was traveling. That is one way that something like that can happen. So anyway, what do you guys think about crazy stuff like this? You know, I mean, I, like, like I said, this has nothing to do with Forrest Mann. It's just I'm trying to look for odd topics to get in the in the future and try to investigate things and you know i like i said i believe there's got to be other life forms and if they are it would make sense that they would visit us and like street said there's no reason to really fear them because if they wanted to kill us they obviously would have done it a long time ago they would have technology to do it they could wipe us out so if anything they're either observing us or you know, for those of you that don't believe in God, maybe we are, you know, a species that they created and they're coming back to see how we're living. Who knows what it is, you know, but if they're living in another um, dimension, you will not be able to see them. They could be standing two feet in front of you and you can't see them.
But occasionally, they might pass through the 3D world, and you would catch a glimpse at them. <clears throat> now, if they rapidly passed in and out of our view, it would make it appear as if they're jumping from one location to another at the exact same time. In other words, it would look like they're traveling through time when, when really they're not, you know. Or maybe they are. I don't know. You know, I mean, it's uh, Einstein that, you know, and, and the scientists believe that you can approach the speed of light, but you cannot exceed it. And they explain various reasons why, but that is all based on science as we know it. And, and you got to remember, like, you know, 2,000 years ago or, or even before that, you know, when humans first came on this earth, they didn't understand a lot of things either. They thought the sun went around the earth. You know, they, they thought the earth was flat. They didn't know what we now know. You know, things evolve over time. Maybe, you know, when you die, for those of you that believe in reincarnation and deja vu, you know, maybe when you die, when you're reborn, you're reborn in the future. Or maybe the future for people on Earth is actually another planet in another galaxy somewhere else. So anybody that's died has moved on. They don't remember who they were. They're living in an advanced tech. You know, we just don't know. I believe that you find out when you die. I just can't imagine that there's nothing happens. You just die and, and that's it. There's got to be something. Unfortunately, there's no way to tell because nobody's ever lived, you know, through real death. And I know there's people that had out of body experiences while they were dying. <clears throat> but a lot of chemistry happens in your body when you're dying and, and they can explain hallucinations and all kinds of weird things that your body is shutting down. Which again would explain some of the odd things that uh, Dutch Schultz said when he was on his deathbed. So nobody really knows if that was ever there. I don't know if I'll look into it. It couldn't have been far from the Bronx, which is where they were from. He's just not going to travel back that far in those days. But it'll be interesting to take a look at maps and stuff like that and look at old stuff. So I just want to know what you guys think about this. And, you know, check out some of the stuff that they talk about. Street no longer has his channel, but but he's always on um, Chasing Indy. And they, they got, you know, she discusses some, some good things. Um, she is not a, a stupid person. Um, and I kind of agree with uh, Eric. I don't know why, you know, like she has to be concerned about old makeup and all kinds of stuff like that because you know it's like these girls that make their lips bigger to me they look like fish faces i i don't understand the point in that you know it just you know you're a smart person just come out and say what you say and uh you know now that we're, we're getting away from ben uh what are we going to discuss next so i'm just curious what you guys think are um and i'm looking for things in the usa it doesn't have to be treasure related, just just mysteries um, that you think that might be real that we can attempt to solve. And that's why, like, D.B. Cooper and Amelia Earhart were good. And the same thing with the Boston Heist. We, we know that those are real things. And so is Dutch Schultz. That was a real person, and he was a real mobster. And, you know, he could have hid stuff. <clears throat> it's not unusual to find old gangsters, stuff like that, go by their old haunts where they used to hang out when they were alive and you know when they went swimming or whatever they drop a ring a, you know, a gold ring in the, in the lake or you know some jewelry or a necklace and then it stays there and somebody finds it you know a hundred years later it's cool stuff that's the kind of stuff that man alone is in by the way he's into that kind of stuff let me know and help me try to decide what to do next and i'll talk to you later peace